this. All right, so guys, this is where we left off last time. Um, and actually, while I know that the, the egg drop animation was life-changing, and uh, actually it was really quite sad, but um, guys, that, that's sort of not the point. We used it as an opportunity to wrap up some important thoughts. And guys, we need to make sure that we're all comfortable with these ideas because this is where we're going to pick up today and we're going to talk about why it is this cold pack does what it does when thermodynamically it shouldn't. So um, let's make sure we're comfortable with these take home messages. Um, then I wanna bring us back to this quick cold pack to make sure we understand the conflict that this brings up for us in terms of spontaneity and then we'll move forward and talk about the new stuff. And questions are great, yeah. So I just was wondering if you could go over again the relationship between uh, the change in S and the change in S. No, because we haven't talked about the change in S. We don't even know what S is. Is S a thing? We haven't talked about S. What? I haven't talked about S and entropy. Entropy. You speak of something of which we have not spoken. <laughs> but, wait, yeah, we're going to. Yeah, that's what we're doing. No, 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 you're right. That's, that's, that's where we're going. So, but, but guys, let, let's make sure, and, and in all seriousness, we just need to make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves. So, guys, with this said, these are the thoughts that we have swimming around in our brain, unrelated to the quick cold pack for right now. So, guys, last time in class, we brought forth this idea of spontaneity. And we said that a spontaneous process is a process that happens with outside intervention other than the nudge, right? The nudge for burning uh, methane is the lighter. The nudge for the ball rolling downhill is literally the nudge. Um, but what we're saying is, is that a spontaneous process is a process that happens on its own with outside intervention. So guys, when we talk about spontaneous, we then brought in these ideas of irreversible and reversible processes. So guys, let's do reversible first. So if we have a reversible process and it goes this way, can it also go that way? And not only can it, it does. You guys good with that idea? So a reversible process is a process that goes this way, but magically it goes this way as well. But what is true for a reversible process? What's true of both of those directions? No, well, and that's the name of this, but what is true of these processes at equilibrium? And not just energy, work and heat. So guys, and, and maybe, I don't know if you, it doesn't sound like we're clear on this. I don't have anything other than to just reteach last time. So I don't want to dig back through the notes, but let's talk. So the idea is this, guys. If we have a reversible process, it goes this way through a pathway that has an associated work and heat change with it. And it comes back through the same pathway with the same change in work and change in heat. The example that we used in class was ice water at zero degrees Celsius. What does ice water do at zero? Melts and freezes simultaneously. And if you come back in a day, a week, a month, or a year, assuming the water hasn't evaporated, it looks the same because it's melting and freezing at the same time. Same work, same heat, no change, reversible. Good? Questions on that? Okay, so then guys, we talked about irreversible processes. Can irreversible processes go backwards? Yes. yes, and guys, that's where this word gets tricky because you hear irreversible and you're thinking it's irreversible. It can't go back. Guys, anything can go backwards if you push it hard enough, and that's the point. So we looked maybe at an example Oh, hold on, I gotta turn my board on. So I don't, well, we did look at some examples. So guys, we looked at these examples and we said that if we've got a ball and it's on a hill, it rolls downhill. When it gets to the bottom, can it go back up? Yeah, but understand that means it's irreversible. 
Do you see the, it's not a play on words. It requires that you understand the definition. So this is irreversible. The idea is that it can go the other way. It's just you've got to do work on it to get it go the other way that wasn't required for it to roll downhill. Then guys, we talked about this. We talked about the burning of methane, and I'm not going to balance this, but this is what happens inside your Bunsen burner. So this reaction happens all on its own, and it does this. Can it go backwards? Yes, you can take carbon dioxide and water and turn it into methane and oxygen, but you've got to do a lot of work to get that to happen. And then we talked about the rusting of a nail and again, I'm not going to balance it, but we said that nails rust all on their own. And, but could we take a rusted nail and turn it into iron and oxygen? Again, yes. So guys, the idea is that all three of these processes are irreversible. Now, does that mean they can't be undone? Yeah, they can be undone, but what is it that makes them irreversible relative to their undoing? It takes a lot of energy and work and heat that weren't required to get the forward process to happen. So guys, these can go backwards. All of these can go backwards, but it's a different change in work and a different change in energy. And as a result, they're not reversible because they don't go forward and backward through the same change in work and the same change in heat. Now let's do questions again. Just babble and we'll make sense of it. Go ahead. Sorry. So when a thing goes hard and it's like this is hard to do Okay. And then it's like not that much energy, right? Well, not like, first of all, say for like the methane thing. Okay. And then it's a lot more to put it backwards. Okay. To like put it back in its original state. Mm-hmm. Well, so, but, and that's the tricky thing with spontaneous. The, the, and, and we haven't brought these terms into the conversation yet, but we could start to talk about it now. So say, for example, we, um, you brought up the methane one, so let's do it. So can we take carbon dioxide and water and turn it into methane? Sure. And you're understanding that that's going to take a different amount of work and heat in order for that to happen. And your question is, where does that come from? Well, it depends. If it's a plant, kind of, just a second. If it's a plant, it's the sun. That's kind of what photosynthesis is. It takes carbon dioxide and water and it doesn't turn it into methane, it turns it into sugars. But, but where does the energy come from depends on what's doing the undoing. Um, I mean, if this is a chemist in a lab, it could be a Bunsen burner or enzymes or catalysts or whatever it is. If it's a plant, it's the sun. Not quite the same reaction, but you get the idea. So the answer to your question is, is specific to whatever's doing the undoing. Keep going. You're okay. You lost me on that one. Yeah, and so I, I want to talk about that momentarily because this is not violating the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and I, I, I never say this the first day because people's heads go pow. But we'll talk about that in just a moment because we're not violating the first law of thermodynamics. And we're going to say this in a second before we move forward, but I don't want to do it yet. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, let's say this right now. So guys, we're now ready to have this conversation. So we've got, well, let me, let me do one other thing first so that we can talk about this fully. So guys, are you comfortable with the idea that all three of these, balls and methane and iron rusting, all three of these things are irreversible? Good? Irreversible. You're okay? Okay, so guys, if they're irreversible, they have a direction that they always go, they have a direction that they never go. Does that mean they can't go in the never go direction? It just means they need to be pushed. Do you get the idea? Okay, so guys, let's bring this all together into the one big thought, and then we're going to answer your question because it's important. So guys, what do all the three of these reactions therefore have in common, given that they're all irreversible? They're all spontaneous. Guys, all 
irreversible processes are spontaneous and all spontaneous processes are irreversible. Now your book uses some terminology for this that maybe you remember. So we'll talk about it this way. So we will say that, are you sold all of these are spontaneous? So what they have is they have what we call a spontaneous direction. This is the direction that they all go on their own. So they have a spontaneous direction and then they all have a non-spontaneous direction. It doesn't mean they can't go that way. It just means they don't go that way on their own. Do you get the idea? So irreversible and spontaneous are, are interchangeable. We'll use spontaneous. And then guys, when we talk about spontaneous processes, they have a spontaneous direction they always go and a non-spontaneous direction they never go, but we can force them to go the non-spontaneous direction. It just involves different amounts of work and heat. Let's pause there. Things we need to talk about. You're okay? Okay, now guys, we're going to focus in on this idea of different amounts of work and heat. You ready? Goes like this. Let's, let's take our, our methane example. Let's take this one. And so we're sort of getting comfortable with the idea of writing these energy things. And again, guys, I'm not going to balance this. And so what's in between reactants and products? The hump the activation energy hump, which goes like this. Now, guys, here's the trick. This distance, if you will, right here, is the total change in energy. Let that sink in for a minute. This is energy on the y-axis. And so this distance from reactants to products is the total energy change of the reaction. Does that make sense? Is that okay? You're sure? That's good? Okay, so is this endo or exothermic? How do you know it's exothermic? Products are below reactants, right? So guys, these are our reactants, these are our products, and the products have less energy than reactants. That means this is exothermic. That's what Hess's law is all about, and we could figure out what that number is, right? Okay, now guys, what about this? What if we switch roles and if this is now our reactant side and this is now our product side, what's the change in energy for the reaction? The same but opposite, right? Now it's endothermic, but guys, delta E holds true. Delta E is still the change in energy for the reaction. It's just that it's in the other direction. And so in this case, it would be positive rather than negative. Does that make sense? You okay with that? Hold on. Is that okay? Does, you all right with that idea? Okay, so now guys think about this. How do we change energy? Well, work and heat, right? So this is actually the product of the change of work and the change of Q, heat. And so guys, here's the thing you got to understand. The forward and the reverse processes involve the same amount of work and the same amount of heat. In total in total. So the idea is this, going forward and backward for all these reversible, pro irreversible processes that have a direction they always go in a direction they never go, delta E is the same. The energy change for these processes is the same. The thing that changes is the amount of energy that changes as a result of work and the amount of energy that changes as a result of heat. And that's what makes them irreversible, is it's their work heat balance. So think about that relative to the egg drop. So guys, we've got an egg, right? And when we drop the egg, what does it do? It falls and splatters. Why does it do that? Because it's releasing energy. Because remember we talked about the idea that we could pick up the pieces of egg and knit them back together and put the yolk back inside and turn it back into the egg? Does that ever happen? On its own. No, but could it happen? It could, but what is it going to take? Literally a lot of work. Guys, it takes work to knit that thing back together. But if we could measure the amount of work that had to go into that egg to turn it back into the unbusted egg, it would be the same amount of energy that was lost when the egg splattered. 
The difference is, is that pushing it backwards requires more work. Going forward releases more heat. Do you see the difference? But the sum of work in, was that helpful to talk about the egg? But the sum of work in heat is delta E. So in, in spont, let's go back here. So in spontaneous processes, the difference is the work heat balance. So when methane and oxygen become carbon dioxide and water, that gives off a lot of heat. To turn these things back into methane and oxygen would take a lot of work. But if we could add the work and heat in this direction and the work and heat in that direction, they'd be the same in total. Do you get the idea? Okay. And you'll see questions on that on the AP test. They'll say, hey, we've got a reaction that is spontaneous. What do you know about the, uh, the change in energy for the forward and reverse processes? They're the same. The work and heat numbers are different, but their total will be the same. Does that make sense? Okay, so guys, let's pause. What else do we need to talk about before we move forward and talk about why the quick cold pack works? So we've got reversible, we've got irreversible, and let's make sure we're clear. Daniel said this, but guys, reversible processes are what? Where are they? Reversible. Reversible processes are equilibrium processes. Matt, sit fast. So, guys, we've got reversible, which are at equilibrium. We've got irreversible, which we call spontaneous. They have a spontaneous direction they always go, a non-spontaneous direction they never go, but the energy changes for both are the same. Um, it's just the work heat balances are different. You guys okay? You're good? You're good? All right. So, guys, now let's talk about this ridiculous thing. So, now we've got, and we may as well write it down while we're at it, so guys, and you don't need to write this down. I think you've already got it. So this is ammonium chloride. This goes into water. It breaks into ammoniums and it breaks into chlorides. What's the sign for delta H for this process? What's the sign for delta H for this process? Positive. That's why it's, okay guys, let's listen. Okay, so guys, what's our system? The pellets. The ammonium chloride pellets that are in here are our system. And when we break the inner bladder, the pellets go into the water and they dissolve. That's what's represented up here. When they dissolve, this is a strong electrolyte. It completely ionizes, but it feels cold. So guys, are we the system or the surroundings? Us. We're the surroundings and we can feel the heat transfer from our flesh into the system. That's what makes this a cold pack. So energy is going from us, the surroundings, into the system. As a result, this is endothermic. So what's the value for delta H? It's positive. And guys, you may remember that this caused a problem for us. We said that that shouldn't be spontaneous that processes that release energy, balls rolling downhill, iron rusting, methane burning, processes that release energy tend to be spontaneous, but now we ran into this endothermic process that we know is spontaneous, and we know that because we don't have to keep shaking it to get it to happen. And remember, that caused us a crisis, right? We're like, wait a second, why is this spontaneous if it's endothermic? You all caught up with me? Okay, now guys, we're going to talk about the answer. Here we go. So guys, the answer to the question, well, actually, let me give you this. Guys, the answer to the question is actually this. The enthalpy change of a system, and I don't know if you got to write this down last time. Guys, the enthalpy change of a system is not enough to determine if it'll be spontaneous. Because if it was, the quick cold pack wouldn't work. All right, Brandon, you ready for your moment in the sun? Yeah. All right, be ready. Don't miss the cue. So guys, if enthalpy change is not enough for us to figure out whether or not a system will, whether or not a process will be spontaneous, what is missing from our understanding? Randomness. That's it. Guys, it's randomness. Brandon did pretty good right there. With emotion, it was clear. Sounded a little excited, but appropriately so. I thought it was great. 
But guys, in all seriousness, that's the answer. Now guys, here's the thing that you've got to get your head wrapped around right now. Ready? What is energy? And I don't mean what's the definition. Guys, what is energy? How do you know it's there? How do you know when there is some? How do you know when you're getting more? How do you know when it's going away? How do you know what it does? And guys, it's all experiential and we take it for granted. We talk about I'm low energy, I'm high energy. And, and we talk about energy moving as heat and all these different things. But guys, energy, and we're, we tend to be comfortable with this, energy is a driving force that makes things happen. Remember we said it was the ability to make a change. Um, we said that changing things happens through heat and work. But guys, we're comfortable with this idea that energy drives things. Randomness is harder. Because we understand, I would propose to you that we understand randomness better than energy. Remember what I did with Matt's, well, let's do it again. <laughs> Matt, Matt's stuff was all stacked up, right? And now it's not terribly random. But if I spread his stuff around the room, it becomes more random. Energy is, in, or I'm sorry, randomness is interesting because we are better at conceptualizing randomness. It's hard to conceptualize energy. It's easier to conceptualize randomness. But the other thing tends to be true. It's easy for us to understand energy drives things. It's harder for us to understand that randomness drives things. But guys, the bottom line is randomness is a driving force in our universe. It's one of the two things that makes stuff happen. One of them is a release of energy. Guys, the other is an increase in randomness. Now guys, here's the trick. When we think about randomness, we think about disorder. Can you connect those two in your head? Guys, when we think about randomness, we think about disorder, how screwed up something is. Guys, never, ever, ever in this class, in physics too, never think about organization and order. Did you hear that? Never make the mistake of thinking about order or organization. You want to think about unorganized and disordered. Why does it matter? The sign change. Okay, so guys, we will always think about disorder. So if I take Matt's stuff and I organize it, what happened to disorder? Did it go up or down? Down. And what happened? Disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now what just happened to disorder? It went down, right? Now what's happening to disorder? It's going up. But now guys, watch this. What just happened to order? It went up. And now what's happening to order? Do you see the difference? If you think about order or if you think about disorder, the ups and the downs change. So guys, it's always disorder. So now this has a high, a high disorder and now it has a lower disorder. So the change in disorder was negative. It was becoming less disordered. Do you see the distinction? It's critical that you understand it that way. Okay, so guys, let me drive home this idea to you that randomness is a driving force. I lifted this out of the book, but it's a wonderful example. Guys, don't try to write this down, but consider this system. Functionally, what you've got here is a couple gas cans. You could even think of it like this. It's functionally Two, I should try this. It's only two, two cans of gas stuck together like that. But one of them's empty and the other one's full. One of them's empty and the other one's full. Now the question is this, and this one's actually pretty close to empty, but I don't dare try this. But guys, the answer is this. If I, or the question is this. If I open up both of these valves, or in the case of my drawing on here, just the valve in the middle, realizing that shouldn't be blue. That actually should be clear because there's no, that's empty. You get the idea. So guys, the question is this. If I open the valve, open the valve, what's going to happen to the gas? What's going to happen to this gas? It's going to spread out, right? Volume. So this gas is going to spread out. 
And eventually what's going to happen? Yeah. But what's it going to look like? Guys, if we have one atmosphere of gas over on the right, if we get the barrier out of the way, what are we going to end up with? We're going to end up with half an atmosphere of gas in both containers. Now, here's the question. Are those molecules still moving? If we could tag these molecules, would it be the same half an, half an atmosphere of gas over here and the other half an atmosphere of gas over here? Or are they still moving from side to side? They're still moving from side to side, but what do we know about the rate at which they're moving this way and the rate they're moving this way? They're the same. And so, and you keep saying this, Catherine, so what do we call that if they're moving the same at the same rate? They're at equilibrium. And so guys, eventually, very quickly, what's going to happen is we're going to have equal numbers of molecules on both sides. Now, here's the interesting question. Why? Why do the molecules spread out? We, and maybe we should say this. Guys, do we have to do anything to force this to happen? Do we have to squeeze this to get them to move? Do we have to heat this to get them to move? No, as a matter of fact, the temperature doesn't change. This is what is called isothermic. The temperature doesn't change. So guys, what on earth is driving this process? Well, maybe we should say this, is it spontaneous? Yeah, yeah. that gas spreads out spontaneously, but the energy doesn't change. Temperature doesn't change. So what's driving it? And we're going to talk about it a little bit, Daniel, in just a second. What, Catherine? Okay, go ahead, Emma. Interesting. Yeah, and you actually, you'll find out when we do this unit on gases, they could give us the volume of these things, and we could talk about molarity. And if you think it really is a concentration, right? And the concentration of the one on the right is going down and the left's going up until they become equal. Yeah, and you could think of it that way. But why? Yeah. Okay. Okay, but not all of them. And guys, understand, you're, you're close to the answer. Um, but I don't want to tell you the answer, and I don't want to take away from what you're thinking. I'm just giving you the opportunity to think out loud. So what is forcing this to happen? Yeah. So if you think that way, you could say what's, if you flip a coin, yeah. a thousand times, yeah. okay. you could say what are the odds that all of them are going to be heads? It's probably going to be very low. Okay. But you say what are the odds that it's going to be around 50-50? Okay. The odds of that would be a lot higher. So comparing that to here, the odds that like let's see in this room that all of this gas, all the gas molecules mm -hmm. are located on that half of the room. Okay. It's like billions and it's gonna be very low. But the odds that it's gonna be around fifty fifty is a lot higher than if it's just over there. So it's a So you're suggesting that probability is a force that drives processes as if these gas molecules are magically flipping coins. You're actually not far from wrong, or far from right. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts? Go ahead. like that. Other thoughts? Y'all done? Or are you just scared to talk? You guys are all done? You guys aren't scared to talk. I know you better than that. Okay, so guys, let, let, me, let me offer this as maybe a way to conceptualize this idea. Um, Daniel's actually right. This is a question of probability and choice. But you've got to be careful because we know that gas molecules are not sentient. 
they aren't making choices and you've got to be careful to assign choice to a particle. But a better way to think of it is options. So allow, and you know what guys, if, if you want to do this with me, you certainly could. Um, but let me, it, it, do you want to write this down with me? It's up to you. If you do, what you need to do is recopy what you've got on the board there in your notes. But I'm going to do this whether you want or not. So, guys, we're going to think about this relative to options. And so when we look at this top system, we're going to say that each one of these vessels is an option. Okay, so in the top system, how many options do these gas molecules have? Well, they have one. There's one place that they can be. Now, in the bottom setup, how many options do they now have? Well, they have two. So, in the bottom system, in the bottom container, I got to stop using system, in the bottom container, the molecules now have two options, two places they can be. And guys, it's at this point that this very literally does, let me see what this is going to look like. That's actually what I was hoping for. So guys, at this point, it very much does become a question of probability. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We understand that this is moles of gas, right? Like Avogadro's number times a multiplier. That's a lot of things. Let's narrow this down to two. So guys, let's say that there are one and yellow will stand out. There are two gas molecules inside this, um, inside this container. Where else can those gas particles be? Nowhere. That's all they got. Guys, they've only got one option. As a result, they're confined to that space, and that's where they're stuck. But now, guys, and we should say, what are these gas molecules doing? They're moving randomly. They're bouncing into things all over the place. But now, guys, when we pull the barrier out, now we've got two options. So guys, as these molecules are moving randomly and running into each other, sometimes they'll run into the hole. And if they run into the hole, they end up in the other container. So now, guys, let's think about the way these things can be distributed. And we're going to write down the options down here, and I'm going to have to do some quick clicking to make sure that I get the colors right. So guys, we've got two gas particles, one red, one yellow. So could it be, even with the barrier open, that we could have a yellow and a red particle. Could they both be there? Absolutely. That's possible. It could be that neither of them have hit the hole and they're both over here. Now, guys, what about this? Is this possible? Could they be like that? Yeah, they could, right? They both could be on either side. But... What are the other possible outcomes that could happen with these particles? We could have one yellow over here and one red over here. Does that make sense? Okay. But is there another way that these things could organize? What's our other choice? One red. Oh, I did that well. That's cool. And one yellow. You get the idea? Okay, so now guys, let's number these. And I'm going to switch back to a thinner pen. So now let's number them. How many different arrangements can we get with these two particles? Four. We've got one where they're both over here, two where they're both over here, and then three and four where they're both spread out evenly between the two. So now guys, look at what we've got. Do you see how these two options are the same? What do those two options represent? What do they represent? Evenly spread out, right? Does that make sense? These are evenly spread out where we've got one on each side. So options three and four represent evenly spread out. So here's what we just found out. A fourth of the time they could be like this, a fourth of the time they could be like this, and then half of the time they're going to be like this. You get the idea? 
But guys, that is only two particles. So where are they going to spend most of their time? Over here, over here, or evenly spread out regardless of which is on which side? Evenly spread out. So with only two particles, we've already determined that half of the time they're going to be evenly spread out and then a fourth of the time they'll be in either other distribution. So most of the time they're going to be evenly spread out. Now what happens if we bring in a third particle or a fourth particle or a fifth particle or on and on and on and on and on? Well, guys, what you would find if you do the math, and the math is actually in our book, the more particles you add, the more likely they'll be evenly distributed and the less likely they will be pooled completely on one side or the other. And when you start talking about Avogadro's number of particles, all of a sudden you find out that the chance of them being evenly distributed goes to all the time and the chance of them being clogged on one side or the other falls essentially to zero. Is it impossible? No, but the likelihood, as Daniel said, the probability is so low that it basically falls to zero. So guys, as systems, and this is the big idea, as systems become more and more and more complex, as they offer more choices. So as systems have more choices and as there are more particles choosing, again, not really, but choosing between those choices, the more likely they'll be evenly distributed and the less likely they'll be lopsided in either direction. Do you get the idea? And guys, that is literally probability. It is randomness, it is disorder, but bringing together these two ideas of options and lots of participants, guys, in a very, very real way, we find out that systems just left to their own by the law of chance and probability will always drive towards conditions of more randomness because that is the more likely state that they'll take on based on probability. Do you get the idea? So guys, if you want to see more about this, if you have your books with you, um, you are more than welcome to dig into this. Let me give you the reference. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh, their pictures are cuter than ours. So guys, 794, at the top of page 794. So you'll notice at the top of 794, they actually just redrew what we did, right? But then if you look down below that, it actually gives you the math. And this isn't something you ever need to know how to do. But you'll notice that they talk through the math. They say the equation that describes the likelihood of this happening is one half raised to the number of particles. So one half with two particles, you square that, it's a fourth. So the fourth of the time, as we said, a fourth of the time they'll be lopsided and the other remaining section of that will be evenly distributed. So if you bring in a third particle, then it's an eighth of the time they'll either be in one container or the other. But then you bring in Avogadro's number and now all of a sudden you have one half raised to Avogadro's number and you find out the chance of this is functionally zero. It's a big, but then a small fraction, right? And so, guys, that's the point. If you want to read through this more, you can. Um, this goes into a much deeper conversation about microstates, but that's what we're talking about are microstates. Understand, it's not a part of the AP curriculum. You will never be asked to say the words microstate, um, but understand that's the driving principle. The more choices and the more players, the more random. Go ahead. Can I describe to you my daughter's bedroom? My daughter has actually found that there are 11,000 different places she can put the sheets and pillows off of her bed. 
She's also very resistant to making her bed. And so you go up in her room one day and all the crap's in one corner. And then you go up the other day and there might be a pillow here because she was reading and then everything else is in her closet. So in her room, there are like 11,000 different places she can put stuff and she's found a way to take advantage of all of them. So if she's got 11,000 different places she can put things and if she's got two sheets and two pillows, all of a sudden we understand randomness because her room is never the same twice and it's always a mess right? Everything works like this. It's not just gas molecules with separate little holes they can go into. It's anything where things can be in different places and those different places have different things that can be in those places. The world just works, the universe just works towards these things being spread out. So, yeah. Um, the math in the book. Yeah. If there had been, instead of just two blasts, there were three. Yeah. So the fraction would be a third to the power of the participants. Yeah, I think that's true. I'm not honestly sure. It's been a long time since I've looked at the math of this. Although, Matt, if you're actually really interested to look at this, I went to a, a lecture series up at the University of Utah for AP teachers, and they actually went through all of the math of microstates, and I could send you the PowerPoint slides if you want to trudge through them. It wasn't fun, but you're what? Tell me at the end of class if you want. Okay, so guys, you okay with this idea of randomness? All right, so what do we need to know? Well, guys, functionally, we need to know this, and don't write this down, but this is the take home message that this, we need to figure out why this happens. And again, you don't need to know microstates. I only share it because I think you guys might find it interesting. But guys, the bottom line is this this happens. You pull out this thing. Thing, and they go whoop, and they spread out. You don't have to coax it. You don't have to shake it. You don't have to squeeze it. You don't have to heat it. It happens. So again, the question is why? And the answer is randomness. And guys, randomness is a driving force in the universe. Understand, I won't let my daughter use it as an excuse to not clean up a room, but in fact, it's true. Even her room is subjected to randomness and left to its own devices, it's going to fall apart. So what does she have to do to avoid it? Work, but never mind. Okay, so guys, bottom line is everything is moving towards conditions of more randomness and it drives things to happen. You get the idea? Okay, so guys, with that said, let's stop calling this randomness and let's call it what it is. It's entropy. So guys, let me give you some things that you need to sort of take home with you. So guys, entropy is the disorder of a system. Again, please do not think order. It will trip you up. And so when we think about disorder, the idea then, and again, the reason we think of disorder is that determines the sign. So... Disorder or entropy is abbreviated S. There you go, Brandon. And the more disordered or random a system is, the larger the entropy. I'll let you catch up. considering giving you a value here. Uh, no, I'm not going to. All right. Okay, you guys got the idea? Okay. So guys, as we get into this idea then of randomness, um, I need to help you appropriately expand your view, if you will. So guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some, a, a specific process. And we are going to look at the ordering and disordering that's taking place as this is going on. 
for one lucky participant, this is actually going to be all the answers to the lab that you're going to do on Wednesday. Well, prepare for Wednesday, do Friday. Because if you get table salt, then this is all the answers. So, understand that only one of your groups will get table salt. Some of other groups will get other salts, and you'll have to think through this as well. So, so guys, here we go. We're going to talk about the dissolving of table salt. I probably should have been specific. This is NaCl. Now, guys, here's the interesting thing about table salt. Table salt dissolving in water is also an endothermic process. Just like ammonium chloride, and we're sold on that, right? When ammonium chloride dissolves, that's endothermic? Yeah? yeah. Okay. When table salt dissolves, that's also endothermic. So guys, why don't we make quick cold packs out of table salt? It's not as endothermic. Um, the, the delta H, I just looked it up. The delta H per mole for dissolving table salt is like three kilojoules per mole. And I think this is more on the order of like 20. I'm not actually sure. But the delta H for this, and of course those are positive, the delta H for this is a lot higher, so you get more bang per mole, if you will. Um, but guys, dissolving table salt in water is exactly the same. If you could feel it, it would actually feel cold um, because it's uh, endothermic. So guys, dissolving table salt in water is endothermic. So here then becomes the question. If this is endothermic, should it be spontaneous? Should dissolving table salt in water be spontaneous based only upon the fact that it's endothermic? Should not, because we got to pause. If you don't understand why, you've got to deal with this misconception or lack of conception. Guys, what things happen on their own? Why do balls roll downhill? Why does methane burn? Why do nails rust? Why do these things happen? They're releasing energy. They are exothermic. So guys, exothermic processes are the ones that tend to be spontaneous. So if you've got a process that's endothermic, you need to understand there's something else going on. We're getting to what's going on, but guys, understand endothermic processes typically don't happen on their own. So you okay with the idea this should not be spontaneous because it's taking in energy? Okay, so now the question is this, is it spontaneous? What happens when you dump salt in water? It dissolves. So guys, we know experientially that it is spontaneous. It does happen on its own. Guys, the question then is why? Why does this happen? So what are your thoughts? Guys, why does this happen? What allows it to happen? What are we talking about? Disorder. Guys, it's all about randomness. It's all about entropy. So ready? Find it. Find the change in entropy that's causing salt, whether it's table salt or ammonium chloride. Find the increase in entropy that's causing this otherwise unfavored endothermic process to take place. Have we watched this video together? This is the dissolving of salt in water. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water. Oh my gosh. So guys, by the end of the year, this is going to become your favorite video in the whole wide world. We're going to watch this like 11,000 times. Here comes one. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. Okay, here we go. We just watched it three times, just right there. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. All right. Guys, talk to me about entropy. 
where in this video is the entropy going up? Because if we can't find it, then we can't explain why table salt dissolves in water because relative to enthalpy, it shouldn't. Where's it at, Catherine? Be careful with molecules. Those are contradictory. Good. So, okay, so guys, talk to me about salt ions. Keep going. What's happening? Okay, so as the water is, like, breaks it apart. Yes. Spawn, okay. It's it okay. It's like okay. Instead of being confined in this little spot, it's mm -hmm. now spread out Wonderful. Hey, and guys, let me, Catherine, you know I love you, so I get to pick on you a little bit. So, guys, be careful with feel like, okay? Um, you, many times we write as we speak. And I understand what you're saying. You're like, I feel like this is what's happening. When you're writing, don't do that, okay? Um, but, but so let's talk about what she's seeing. So guys, this is what a salt crystal looks like. Tell me about entropy, high or low? Low. low. Guys, crystals have amazingly low entropies. They are repeated. They are in fixed positions. These don't have microstates, do they? because they can't move around. They're locked in position. So what gives them any entropy at all? They're moving. So guys, the entropy that we see inside crystalline structures is simply because they're moving. You ready for a deep thought? Can we make them move slower? Can we make them stop? At what temperature? Guess what the actual definition of absolute zero is? The point where entropy becomes zero. Did that make sense? Because now they can't move and they can't wiggle. Therefore, there's no disorder and entropy becomes zero at absolute zero. You don't need to know that, but it's interesting. Okay, so guys, they're wiggling and they're doing this. And then all of a sudden, a water molecule comes along and goes, hey, come with me. And now this guy's got options, right? And now that this guy's got options, what do we have? Yeah. We've got more randomness. We've got more disorder. So guys, as the water molecules come along and pick this dude apart, just like watch the interact the with the ions on the surface. Watch the randomness go up and up and up and up. You guys seeing the randomness going up? I would argue with you you're not. Oh boy, guys, check this out. If I continue to let this play. What's happening to the water molecules? They're less random. So guys, you've got to understand that when you think about randomness, you don't get to just focus on the thing you want to think about. You've got to look at the entire process. So now, guys, let's talk. And this is important. Don't get lost in sort of the interesting part of this. You've got to understand the important parts of this. So, guys, what happened to the randomness of the water molecules? They went down. So, guys, the entropy of the water went down. S is entropy. What happened to the entropy of the salt? It went up. Now, guys, here's the question. How much did the entropy of the salt go up in general terms? More than this and more than the delta H for the reaction, which is positive. Let that sink in. So guys, what does this mean that the delta H for this process is positive? It's endothermic. It's taking in energy. Does that favor spontaneity? No. It doesn't. That works against spontaneity. So guys, this works against spontaneity. Now, what about the fact that the water is becoming less disordered? We're going to find out that also works against spontaneity. So how much does the entropy of the salt have to go up? It's got to go up more than this 
and this put together. And in fact, it does. And we'll work on quantifying that later. But the idea is this. The reason that salt spontaneously dissolves in water is because the, um, the, the amount that the entropy of the salt goes up is greater than the amount that the entropy of the water goes down and greater than the amount of heat that's absorbed as the process takes place. And we're going to work on quantifying that next time. But guys, that's the big idea. Entropy is a driving force. Increasing entropy is a driving force. But that driving force has to overcome the forces that are working against it. And the forces that are working against it is a decrease in the disorder of the water. Because we see the water molecules all organized now and the, the endothermic nature of the process because energy is going in and spontaneous processes want to lose energy. not in a way that we're going to make sense of. You'll, you'll never be given a substance and be asked, what will the entropy of this substance be? Um, there's a lot of factors that play into it. Intermolecular forces, polarity, size, temperature, mass, all sorts of things. Um, you won't be put in that position. Okay. So guys, do you understand the idea? That when we look for disorder, and here, let me give it to you in note form. Guys, when we look for disorder, we need to consider all the parts of the system. Because many times we will involve both an ordering and a disordering process. And if this process is spontaneous, the disordering process will be dominant. All right, you ready? We're going to wrap this up. Good to go? Okay. So guys, you got one more page of notes and we're done for the day. And then what will happen is when we get together on Wednesday, we're going to sort of wrap our arms around this new idea of entropy and we're going to start quantifying this. And then on Friday, we'll finally get to have the final conversation about spontaneity. We good to go? What? I will. We'll do it through the screencast. It'll be fine. Okay, so guys, first law of thermodynamics says what? Conserve. Energy is conserved. The law of conservation of energy. Here comes the second law of thermodynamics. I already told you this. What are you never going to do? Yeah. Google this. With the understanding that you're now going to go home and Google this. But. Okay, so guys, here's the deal. When you think about entropy, you need to broaden your horizons. Unlike enthalpy, where we're just system and surroundings. When we consider entropy, we've got to consider everything, the system and the surroundings. Equation I'm about to show you. <coughs> so, guys, so guys, when we think about the system, system and the surroundings, what are we, what are we now talking, talking about? about? The, the universe. universe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, when, so when we, we talk about, about entropy, entropy, we talk we about, talk about a total change in entropy, entropy, which is termed term, the entropy, entropy change in the universe, universe, which is delta, delta S the universe. universe. This just got weird. So this, this takes into consideration, consideration everything. everything. The system, the system and the surroundings. I wouldn't write down that sentence. I wouldn't write down this equation. The entropy change in the universe is equal, is equal to, to the system, the system plus, plus the surroundings. The, surround. the change in entropy of the system and the change of entropy of the surroundings. So, 
So if any everyone ever comes to you and says, what's the universe? You just tell them the system plus the surrounding. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that would have brought about the desired result. Because you were clearly done with that conversation, and that would have only gotten me more excited. Yeah, so no, that, that, no. It would have been kind of you, but. <laughs> he was. You'll notice I walked by quickly and went yeah. to the bathroom because I did not want to get caught up in that. All right, so guys, you ready? Now we're ready to sort of bring this back to something a little more comfortable. So here we go. In a reversible, right? Right there in print. In a reversible process. But what do we understand, especially from review about reversible processes? They're at equilibrium. Guys, if we have a process that is reversible, the change in entropy of the universe is zero. Would it be helpful to bring us back to an example? So I, I, this, this example works great in my brain. And it's a uh, thin pen. So remember our cup of ice water? And if we only have, I'll just draw one ice cube. Remember what we've got going on. We've got water molecules that are freezing, but for every water molecule, oh, what about this? What happens to the entropy of that water molecule as it freezes? Does its entropy go up or down? Down. Fewer choices. Its entropy goes down. But for every water molecule that freezes, what happens to an ice molecule? It melts. What is the net change in entropy? Zero. And if we want to bring in the rest of the universe, remember this is T is equal to zero Celsius. Guys, remember the idea is that this goes on forever. This, the, the bigger world doesn't have to do anything to this. If it's at zero, it does this forever, and there's no net change in entropy. So this is equilibrium. The entropy change of the universe is zero. Good? Freezing and melting happening simultaneously or any other equilibrium process. So what now, guys, if the process is spontaneous? Well, if it is an irreversible and therefore spontaneous process, if that's the case, order is not conserved. The change in entropy of the universe will go up. So guys, for any process that happens spontaneously, the entropy of the universe is going up. So entropy is not conserved. Order is not conserved. There is no law of conservation of entropy where the, if, where the amount of it, that the entropy of the system goes up, the surroundings goes down. It doesn't work that way. Entropy always goes up all the time unless it's at equilibrium. So entropy can never go down. It either doesn't change, that's equilibrium, or it goes up. Guys, entropy is always going up. So, the disorder of the universe is always increasing. Go ahead, man. Can't, like, it can't go down at all. Does that mean, like, at one point, everything just going to be, like... Yeah, so watch, right? So, you, you've, seen me make, you've seen me make disorder go down. Disorder just went down, right? Yeah. Here, but it went up for me. My, my physically doing this to your papers means that I had to expend calories, I had to do work, I might have sweated a little bit. My molecules got more messed up in doing this, and my molecules got more messed up than your stuff got organized. So anything that happens is a net increase in entropy somewhere in the universe. It gets worse. Right, right. Oh yeah, so as, as, as my daughter goes in and cleans her bedroom, it's becoming less disordered. 
gets ready for a really deep thought. Her bedroom is becoming less disordered, but what does she have to do to do that? Well, she has to do work. And the physical process of her doing work creates an increase in disorder. Where? Well, in order to have the energy to do the work, her body needs to take food and reorganize it and break the bonds in order to get the energy in order to do the work. And that disorganization that's taking place as she's burning calories and doing work is greater than the amount of organization she puts into her room. So you ready for a super big thought? Where does all of this come from ultimately for us here on earth in order to be able to do this stuff? The sun. Guys, we think that our sun is our source of energy. But guys, the sun is actually also a source of disorder. Because when the sunlight comes down to earth and allows plants to take carbon dioxide and water and make sugar, which is our, 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 our energy currency, there has to be an offsetting amount of disorder that's happening, increasing in the universe as plants organize carbon dioxide and water into sugars. And so ultimately the sun is not just our source of energy, it's also, also our source of disorder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. Yep. But then Now, don't realize that when we talk about heat and work, there isn't an entropy factor in there. It turns out that doing work causes entropy to go up, but they're not directly related. Um, so I don't know if I can say yes because you lost me at that point. Okay. I'm just saying like because, because that's, the disorder is like connected to the amount of energy, right? Because the more disorder there is, the more energy there is. Yeah. 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 Kind of, but understand like with salt dissolving in water, energy is going. It, so entropy can go up and down. Just a second. Energy can go up and down independent of what entropy is doing. You can have you can have entropy up, energy down, any possible combination. Emma, go ahead. Good. Yeah. Hey. So, guys, let me use that as our transition. Um, when we talk on Wednesday, that's what we're going to do. On Wednesday, we're going to quantify entropy, and then on Friday, we're going to bring enthalpy into this, and then talk about spontaneity. Okay, guys, you've already got your homework. Have a great lunch. <laughs>